Okay, so I think all the kids are uh, on their way to have some great fun. Um, we're going to get started. We have a couple of preliminary questions, um, some introductions, and uh, some questions that seem to be um, very common for parents of PKU um, children they have or the experts up here. Um, and then also, please feel free at any time, raise your hand. This is an interactive uh, meeting. It's not us talking at you, it's us talking with you. So um, please ask questions. That's what they're here for. They, uh, they want you to be able to learn from their experiences. So um, to start off, what we're going to have them do is uh, introduce themselves, um, name, age, um, if you go to school, um, if you do major, if you're in college, if you work, where you work, what you do. Um, any highlights uh, you'd like to include awards, special recognitions um, that you've received at work or school, um, and please don't feel shy to brag. This is your, this is your, you know, please. <laughs> so, so if you want to get started, I guess we'll go. Okay. Well, my name's Leah Orwig. Um, I go to Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, not Carbondale, <laughs> the party school. Um, I'm a junior. I'm a psychology major with a speech comm minor. Um, Let's see, I'm 20 years old. I just turned 20 in July. I, uh, in high school, I was really active in sports and I volunteered a lot. Um, I was the, I received the, one of the Robert Gunthrie PKU scholarships my freshman year of college. Um, I'm also, I've also continued volunteering in college. I'm a part of a student leadership <coughs> development program at school. Um, I, in intramural sports, I'm really active in that. And I received a grant from the Illinois Campus Compact to organize uh, the Nationals Raise Your Voice campaign on campus. So I've been a student coordinator of that for a year. So that's what I've done. <laughs> My name's Kathy Fatanik. I'm 19 years old. I attend Harper Community College in Palatine. I'm a student ambassador at school. And in high school, I was very active in travel basketball, travel soccer, lots of sports I did. And um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I'm Julie Lotterer. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, my brother sitting next to me, he's from Indiana, Illinois. Um, I'm 30 years old. I just had a baby boy um, ten and a half months ago. Uh, I do have PKU, lived with it all my life. Graduated from college with a criminal justice degree. I work in Indiana for Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield. I felt the health insurance industry was where I needed to be. Um, moved from Buffalo, New York uh, three years ago to Indiana so that they had a better follow-up maternal PKU program there at uh, IU. Um, had wonderful nutritionists there, had a great healthy baby boy, no PKU. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan Springborn. As Julie said, I'm, we're brother and sister. We both have PKU. Um, please don't think that your son is with you know your son that has PKU is going to grow up and look like me. <laughs> I uh, my hair is like this for a reason. <laughs> um, let's see, we we are of five children, so there are other child other siblings who do not have PKU. Um, I am 32 years old. I am done with school. <laughs> Graduated with a bachelor of science about 10 years ago. I am currently working. I live in Illinois now. I'm, been involved with the organization since I've moved here about six years ago. I live and work up in McHenry County. I am in the information technology field. Uh, I have many Microsoft certifications and I'm pursuing more. So I'm here for you guys to pick my brain. So I have some questions here that were pre-written and some that I wrote myself and just in brainstorming, but you all are the ones who are here, so I don't know if there's any shy, not shy people here, but I want to open it up first, and and I have, like I said, I have questions if you all are shy and don't want to talk yeah. or anything, um, and I can inter, uh, intersperse these questions in throughout the, the session. Is there anyone here who has a burning question they just want to ask right now? And All right, over here. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Jay Markham, and I'm not shy. So <laughs> I just I have a question to the brother and sister on the end, and I'm just I got a hundred questions, but I'll start with one. Um, you've obviously lived with this for 32 years, 30, 32 years, and was it difficult during the adolescent ages and going into high school? Um, you know, was there any problems with with your peers and accepting your <coughs> Challenges. Can you repeat the question for us? Sure. Okay, sure. Um, she asked, basically, adolescents, did we have a hard time for going through high school? Did our peers accept us? Um, yeah, I just, you know, kind of, I mean, I've got two boys that have you, okay. and, you know, they're very young, and I'm just kind of a little anxious towards the future as how it's going to affect their lives down the road, and, and you know, somebody who lived with their whole life, it's right. obviously it's all you know, so it's probably not as challenging as we think, since we don't have PKU. So I just kind of want to get your thoughts on that. Sure. Back in Buffalo, New York, our doctor was Ro uh, Dr. Robert Warner, who was very good friends with Dr. Guthrie. Okay. Dr. Robert Warner followed us till we were 16, till he retired. I was 16, he was 18. He always told us to stay on the diet. Do not get off of it. Our doctor that came in after that wanted both of us off of it. Are you still on it now? Yes. I'm on it now. Yes. Okay. I went off of it for yeah. four years when that new doctor came in. Okay. okay. Uh, up until college, went back on it in college. As to your question about adolescence, it was very difficult in the beginning, very difficult. But I was off the diet. I was a totally different person. Okay. Different moods, different attitudes. Just everything was different about me. <clears throat> if I would have been on that diet, I would have been a totally different person. So. It's very different nowadays than it was back in the 70s and 80s when we were told, get off the diet, sure. okay? The children nowadays, I think, I look back, they have it wonderful. The doctors want them on the diet. They don't take them off. So they have it a, a lot better, it, it, different. They're, they're walking a different path than we did. Okay. Thank you. I, I just really quick, I'll um, interject. I've been on it my whole life. I've never come off my diet. I've drank my formula, I call it beverage, my whole life. Um, and the experiences I've had have been good. You know, I've, I've, you know, friends have been accepting of it. You know, they're curious about it. You know, what, why can't you eat this? Why can't you eat that? And I just, you know, give them a quick answer. And then, you know, if I feel comfortable with them, then I'll tell them the whole story and maybe even give them that book, uh, Why is Mary on the Diet? You know? <laughs> Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we have the top, top yeah, of the first edition. Yeah, we've been 30 years, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I've had good experiences, you know, food is always a part of growing up and, you know, you just, you accommodate, you be flexible and you don't, you don't let PKU rule you. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. I think I'll take one of the questions that I, we have written down and then take some, another one, I want to make sure I get everything covered here. Um, Going down the line again, can you please tell us about your time management, including formula, keeping track of diet, sending in blood, and all that fun stuff that goes along with PKU? Well, um, I drink my formula. I, I break it up in the day. I drink some in the morning and some at night. And then um, I'm supposed to take a blood every other week. And sometimes I don't get it in there with finals and stuff coming in at different spots. I kind of miss sometimes, but I usually get it in twice a month. And it's just part of what I do, like just my routine. I don't, I don't make it a big problem, and I just watch what I eat. There's How do you keep track of your feet? Oh, oh. Um, well, I just it, like go into the grocery store. I'll look at the nutrition facts and just kind of gauge what the protein is, and then read the ingredients and see how much is in there. And then I use the um, fee book to track it and I usually go for like 24 grams of protein in a day and then if I'm above that I make sure I drink my formula a lot so okay um I drink basically one in the morning one at night one of my drinks and um I'm not the best at t uh giving him my blood but yeah you know I've got to work on that a little but uh, <laughs> But um, let's see, as far as like the fees go, I basically know at this age, you know, what I can eat during the day and what I can't. Like for instance, if I'm gonna go out at night, 
to a restaurant, I know that I'm not going to eat that much for breakfast or snacks or lunch, only because when you go out, you know, you're not preparing the meal, so you don't exactly know what you're going to get in that meal particularly. So, yeah. Um, for me, I drink uh, three times a day, uh, morning, lunch, and at night. Um, following my exchanges and my fees was a brand new thing when I moved out here three years ago. I was just introduced to it. Um, we weren't really introduced to it in college or high, uh, high school or college. Now I keep track of it religiously. I have that um, the new book, The Exchanges, um, especially when I was pregnant, that was my Bible. It went with me to work everywhere. Um, anything I put in my mouth, I wrote down, wrote the exchange. I do exchanges, I don't do fees, so I don't know if, if everyone understands that, but I did exchanges during my pregnancy. So I had a certain amount of exchanges that I could have. So now I do my blood clots once a month. Um, when I was pregnant, it was every week. Um, once a month right now, and um, I still follow it religiously because you just get into a routine. Um, from when I was pregnant for nine months, you just are very, you get very organized. <laughs> so um, that's my routine. I drink my beverage three times a day still. Uh, I drink Paraflex unflavored, but actually I flavor it with strawberry quick. Um, let's just say I'm bad at giving blood spots and I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, my, although my whole life, my B level has run high. I mean, meaning around the 20 range. I've always been like that. And I, you know, and I don't count exchange, you know, as Julie mentioned. I, uh, I'm very conscious of what I put in my mouth and the amount that I put in my mouth. And I know that, oh yeah, I splurge. I mean, I go overboard sometimes, you know, I, uh, you know, but, that's my routine. And it's like, I've been doing it for so long, I, I, I know, and you know, I know the amounts I should have, I know the amounts I should not have. I know what will put me over the edge and knock me right out, and uh, you know, knock me you know, on the couch for a couple of hours. I, I know that stuff, so I don't really, I don't count exchange. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm okay, yeah, oh. it's cool. Yeah, you can call me from the old school. school. <laughs> <laughs> Um, a question from the audience. Like when your levels are off, because I have a five month old, so her levels were off when she was little, and I'm still at that scared phase where you're like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm Can I ask you, like, do you notice a lot of the bigger changes in yourself, like mm -hmm. immediately? And then that comes yeah. when you kind of go, well, I have to go back to the, yeah. the right way of doing it. The question was, uh, can you please describe the effects that you feel when your levels are high? Is that essentially? Um, I, I guess I could start. Um, in college, uh, my freshman year, I noticed that I went off my track of my diet pretty heavily. I was at like, I'm supposed to have 24 exchanges in a day, and I had around like 74 on my diet. and. <laughs> my roommate was like, what is wrong with you? I was bawling, I was crying. I didn't, I could not concentrate on my homework. I was just every which way and it was, it just did not feel good and I knew that I had to be drinking my formula and watching what I eat, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if, you know, I've missed some formula or something like that or my protein's too high, you definitely feel weak and tired. I especially feel tired. I don't know about any of them, but all I want to do is sleep. So that's when you know you got to go and drink the milk and watch your fees. You do feel it. <laughs> I was very off of it in high school, so my levels were very high for a long time. Very moody, very rebellious. So everything was a constant, my mother and I were just at each other constantly. <clears throat> but it, very moody, I was very tired all the time. My mother knew when my levels were high. Sometimes when I, when I was little, like you're referring to with your um, your son or your daughter, 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 my mother could just tell by holding us there was some odor <coughs> inside of the neck that she could smell. She she knew our levels were high. Yeah. So she would take a blood spot and send it in, and she knew it. It was high. <coughs> I've had the same experience as everyone else on the panel. I just I get tired. I get very tired, and you know. I could sleep for maybe 12 hours, mm -hmm. and I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, could you please describe a family meal um, in your household when you were a little kid? Um, also, if you have, we all know they have siblings with PKU, but if you have siblings and if they have PKU and how that was handled. Um, the typical meal at my family, we would have the meat because I was the only PKU kid. It was my brother, my mom, and my dad. They would have their meat or fish or chicken, whatever. And then we would have a vegetable, and then we would have like a potato, either french fries or mashed potatoes or something like that. So I would have a variety of vegetables, and they could have their meat too and it'd be okay. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Um, no, but my brother didn't really pick on me, or he's, he didn't wonder why I couldn't have meat because he just knew it was what we liked. So that was it. Um, typical meal at our house. Um, my parents, you know, they'd eat their meat. <laughs> and um, my sister, who was unable to be here because she's sick, uh, she also has PKU. And, you know, my mom would fix, you know, vegetables or um, the special bread that we can make through PKU. Um, yeah, we just have like vegetables, <clears throat> fruits, salads, big on the salads and, you know, they, they just go and eat their meat and, you know, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> In our household, it wasn't a big deal. Um, my mother would like the exact same experience with them too. The, we would just have the sides, the vegetables, mm -hmm. potatoes, the salad. But the bread was different. We didn't have that back then, so we were eating regular bread. So mm -hmm. there wasn't really any way to gauge that. Anything you want to add that your sister didn't <laughs> add? Um, I assume the family ate together. <laughs> yeah, we did eat together. <laughs> um, no, but, you know, just to uh, elaborate on what Julie said, that our mother was, you know, very accommodating, you know, Basically, two meals were made, or you know, two meals, you know, everyone else's and then ours, and but that we all ate together, and you know, like Julie said, we had the sides, and we just had, you know, everything but the meat, or everything but, you know, whatever. Or like say a lasagna was made, there would be like a special maybe lasagna that was made for us, so we wouldn't feel you know like left out. But um, yeah, accommodating. Mm -hmm. Question from the audience. <clears throat> Well, um, I'll take this one, I guess. <laughs> um, when, oh, okay, she asked, um, you know, how we feel when others are eating their foods and if her son's gonna feel left out and such. Okay, well, um, when my friends and I go out, let's say we're all going out for pizza, you know, pizza's kind of high in fees because it's got the cheese and everything. But what I do, I, you know, I just take off the cheese. Well, it's kind of funny because when we go out now, my friends start taking off the cheese and they find that it's, it tastes better that way. So I don't feel left out at all. <laughs> Somebody else want to? Um, what is the best thing that your parents did in, uh, as it relates to PKU growing up? Um, my mother made me in charge of filling out my diet sheet and taking my blood when I was really young. Like when I started reading and writing and learning how to count, I was making sure I knew what my diet was like and that was probably, it made me more organized and it made me more aware of what I could and couldn't eat and so it made me independent. <coughs> When uh, my sister and I were both little, you know, she'd have us look at, when we were old enough to understand, you know, protein and what we have to look at. Um, when we were old enough, she made us look at the boxes before we went and even like got a cracker out. She wanted us to look at the serving size and the protein, and, you know. So at this age, I know exactly what to look at and if I can and cannot have it and stuff like that. It's just makes you more aware, like she said, so. Best thing that I know my mother and my father both pushed for back in the 
early 80s, late 70s, was to mainstream my brother and I. Um, when they found out that we had something different, PKU, they had no idea. Teachers and, and, uh, had, and principals had no idea what it was. They wanted to put us in special classes. My mother pushed us to go and be mainstream. There was nothing wrong with us but a diet inconvenience. That's all it was. But she convinced them and we went mainstream and we were fine. That was the best thing I remember that they did. The best thing I remember too to build on that is they didn't treat us any different because we're not different than any of the other siblings. We just eat different. That's it. We're the same as everybody else. It's just like I said, uh, we eat a little different. I mean, we're more aware of what we're eating. That's it. Okay. Question from the audience? Same over there. There's some I'm wondering about you, the two young girls. You were talking about being very active in athletics. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering, um, like, if we could expect that a person to be able to eat more feet if you're working out all the time. Like, how does it affect your level working out? You want to hit that one first? <laughs> um, you're asking how, it, you, is it lower? Is that what you're trying to get yeah, at? I'm wondering if someone is more active, if they would get to eat more, more protein. Well, the thing with me was when I was very active in soccer and basketball, I noticed like I'd eat like basically all fruits and vegetables. So yeah, my level was lower than what it probably is now. It, it was probably significantly lower. But, you know, I think working out does play a role in how your fee level is going to be. So. Yeah, um, I was active pretty much all my life. I was um, in ASA softball. I traveled a lot in volleyball. So I was always doing something. And I don't know if it was that my enzyme activity is higher or if it was because of the <coughs> sports, but I got to eat like um, some pastas maybe here and there. And I mean, it was a low amount, but I did eat some and I was okay. My, my levels were always really low, so. Julie, can you describe your maternal PKU experience? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Can't wait to do it again, no. I had, a, <laughs> I had a wonderful nutritionist who followed me from, well, even before conception, all the way through. Um, my levels had to be extremely low before my husband and I even thought of having a baby. So they followed us starting at the beginning of the year in January last year. Um, we finally ended up being pregnant in April. But every week from January to April, my levels had to be in every week, so they knew where when I conceived what my level was, okay? So I mean, I could tell the exact day what my level was when we conceived. That's the only inconvenience that that was. But the whole nine months was wonderful. I was the healthiest I have ever been in my whole life. I was on the diet. I was taking vitamin, well, prenatal vitamins. I was being followed by the, one of the best OBs in Indiana at IU University. She's a high risk. She's already delivered probably about five or six babies of mother maternal PKUs, uh, who none of them has PKU, none of them has anything wrong with them. Um, I was just followed very closely. Every month I had an ultrasound um, so that um, they could watch the baby's growth. Um, they checked for heart problems um, around the 25th week of my pregnancy to see if he had any holes in his heart, which is a very um, uh, big thing for, um, mothers with PKU, maternal PKU, um, a cardiologist actually had to come in, pediatrician, pediatric cardiologist had to come in, um, his heart was fine. It, it's just every step, there was just a new adventure each week. Um, but I was so healthy, uh, I just, it was wonderful. I can't say anything bad about it. Do you eat a lot of the low protein food company? I hear a lot of the fruits and vegetables, which I, I like. <laughs> but um, do you eat a lot of the pastas and the breads and such from the um, food companies? And if so, you know, it, does your insurance company cover it? Is cost an issue <coughs> there? Or, you know, how do you? Could you repeat the question, too? Okay. Do you want me to start? Start the other one. Okay. She asked if um, we use the low protein foods and if it's cost is an issue. Uh, cost. 
for in my case is an issue. It's those um, low protein foods are kind of expensive for me anyway. Um, the bread is a main staple. I always have the bread around because I'll eat that. I don't know if it was my grandpa's influence or what, but I always eat bread with every meal. Um, and I do, I have ordered some new pastas from Cambrook and the bagels and the energy bi bars, energy bars. They're really good. I, I like them, but I only do, I only order a big load from Cambrook every once in a while. So, but I really, I love them. I don't believe I've tried yet, but it might, it might work. I don't know. Maybe these, one of these can answer that question for you. Um, back in New York State, before I moved here, they had just passed the bill that was passed here in Indiana, and they did pass the bill in 98, Illinois, sorry, <laughs> Indiana, they just passed it, I'm sorry. Um, and they did cover the food up to $2,500. So for a year, um, I would just call into the health insurance. I had a special caseworker who worked with me. Um, I would just call in, fax the bill into her. She would send it through the insurance, and it was paid in full, 100%. So I was reimbursed. Here in, in uh, back in Indiana where I live, um, I pay for it now up front. Uh, it's, right now it's not an issue, but it'd be nice if they did pass that bill. <laughs> Um, to be honest with you, no, not a lot. What I get, I sponge off a of Julie. <laughs> um, like, like she said, um, we do always have that Cambrook baking mix for the bread at our house. Um, that, that's good stuff. Um, yeah, you know, cost can be an issue at times, you know, but. I don't, I don't know, it just, it, it's good food, but, you know, it's a little costly sometimes, so, yeah, it's worth it, though. Yeah, it's worth it. It is worth it. <laughs> um, what are the biggest challenges you face every day living with PKU, and how do you handle them? Let me start at the other end. We'll get okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the biggest challenge is always eating. Like, I'm always you know, worried about if I get invited out to lunch with my manager or my boss, you know, what am I going to eat without having to explain, you know, worrying about explaining, um, you know, how come you're just getting a soup and salad, you know. But the biggest challenge, yes, is, you know, what I'm going to eat um, if I'm in a situation like that. Or um, <clears throat> I take my, uh, I drink my beverage three times a day, so I take my beverage with me at lunchtime, drink it at lunch, and then, of course, you know, I'm always conscious about who's going to see me, you know, drinking it. Oh, what's that? I'm like, oh, it's strawberry milk. That's all it is. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, without having to explain and go into the whole song and dance um, about, you know, why I'm drinking that or what's it for. So, um, you know, like I said, just always being conscious of what you're going to eat. Um, you know, is, is it going to be good for me? Uh, is it, am I, should I not eat it? Basically. Where in my atmosphere, where I work, um, we have an on-site health facility, so there are a lot of people there who are very health conscious. So for me, it's really not an issue because people are always, you know, they're eating salads or they've got protein drinks. Or so when I pull out my protein drink and I drink it at lunch, you know, I at my desk working in between whatever I'm doing, no one really asks. It's not really an issue for me in my atmosphere anymore. It, it was though growing up. Um, in grammar school, in, in elementary school, it was it was an issue. Kids would pick on you. They'd smell the formula. They'd wonder, what are you? Why are you eating different? Why aren't you eating chocolate like me? Why don't you have a grilled cheese like me? Or that was an issue growing up, but not not now for me. No. The biggest challenge for me is probably drinking my milk every day <clears throat> like I'm supposed to. That's that's probably the biggest challenge that I have. Um, ne not necessarily the different foods that I may eat, like she said, you know, they're eating this grilled cheese sandwich and then I have to eat a different grilled cheese sandwich with like this fake cheese as some people call it, but you know, I, I don't really consider that a challenge. I, I just go on and say, hey, you never know, mine could taste better. So. <laughs> the challenge that I thought would be the biggest challenge would be probably going off to school 
and having a PKU diet. Um, I thought, well, how am I going to be able to mix my formula and how will I keep it cold and stuff? And you got to make sure those dorms allow you to have refrigerators. And luckily, we did. I get. I did get a school that let you have refrigerators. And also, in high school, I was wanting to go off to Spain, and I'm like, how am I going to go to Spain? You know, <laughs> how am I going to cart all this <coughs> formula over there? But. <laughs> it's possible. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it wouldn't be a p possibility, but it did. I just had to get a letter of information saying what it was. It wasn't like cocaine or drugs or something. <laughs> it was just it was just my formula. And um, and over in Spain, I did notice that they eat a lot of meat and bread, and I couldn't really find much fruit and vegetables, but I made it, and it was a wonderful trip. I'm glad I went. So, Great. that's good. Question from the audience. Question? What do you want to do with Edith? Okay. Um, she has a 16 year old son, and she was asking for suggestions on how to get him to realize that once you drink the formula, you are fuller and you don't have to eat as many feeds with the food. Um, what I used to do when I was really young is I would wait until after I ate and then drank it because I hated the taste. Um, but I noticed that once you drink it, as you go along eating, you don't really notice the taste of the formula. Um, and maybe just that, suggesting that. that would be something. Fake. Key warnings, um, oh, sorry. Powder, um, spinach, uh, what's the thing? Spinach. Oh, okay. Okay, because um, <coughs> what I'm taking is Plexi 10, and Y you mix that with Kool-Aid, and I, in my opinion, I think that drink is probably the best out there right now, and I just drink that as if it were like water or something at the dinner table. I don't even taste it, and you know, because it's got that Kool-Aid in there, and I don't know, maybe I'll suggest that to you, because cause that's something that I will definitely drink while I'm eating, for sure. The other stuff, you know, I'll just drink after, but. So when you're mixing the drink with the food, it's like nothing. Right, right. Yep. When I, when I was brought up, I was always told by my nutritionist that you could survive basically on just the formula. The food is just an option, really. So I always got into the habit of drinking mine first before I ate, and then then I wouldn't be so tempted to go and eat so much pasta or so much bread. Or, so I, was, I grew up with the concept of drinking it first and then. I have tried it all ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> drinking before the meal, drinking after the meal, and drinking during the meal. It's just, I guess, the way that I feel like doing it when I do it. But um, Julie and I, you know, coming up in the old school, like we haven't tried, we haven't tried mixing it like with Kool Aid or you know Sunny D, like others have. Basically, what we've done is you know we take a measurement of the powder, mix it up in a shake, and then like say she drinks hers unflavored, and I like to flavor it with strawberry quick. That's how we do it, and um, it's like I said, we I've tried it all different ways, and it's just the way that I'm feeling like doing it, but. Uh, Getting, I guess, getting him to realize possibly that you need this, you have to drink this. I mean, basically, I mean, if if that's not an issue, then you know, great, I wouldn't worry about it. I had something else to add to that. Um, I had a question: do, do you mix it like right when you drink it, or do you mix mix it up in a big quantity and then drink it as you go? Um, and like each meal. Okay. Well, I noticed that, um, like I mix mine, I put 24 ounces and then two cups of the formula in, and it lasts me two days. If I keep it cold, 
it tastes better yeah. to me yeah. anyway. So I don't know. That would help too, maybe. Do you feel a difference um, then, like drinking it at first as opposed to in your body, like as opposed to during your meal, just spreading it out or afterwards? Um, well, I find that if I do drink the mix while I'm eating, I will not eat everything that's on that plate. But otherwise, I know that if I wait until after, everything's going to be gone on that plate. And I'll, I almost feel too full to drink my mix. So I don't know. That's just how. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah. You know, so. Um, can you tell us what impact PKU has had on dating, socializing, peer pressure, and all those fun things? Or marriage and drinking? <laughs> <laughs> um, it didn't have an impact in high school, but in college I met my husband, so it was a big impact because then you start thinking about more things in the future. So um, in college he encouraged me to get back on the diet. We got back on it, and I say we because he's my partner. He helps me every day with the challenges, you know, of, you know, he helps make my formula, he helps plan out what are you can eat today, I'll make it for you. So it's kind of like a partnership. So that started in college. So you really need that support of that person because if you don't have given, you're not gonna wanna drink um, your formula. You're, you, you just need that support. And that's been a blessing with me. I've been uh, lucky enough to have friends who have not pressured me to try things that I shouldn't have. It's funny, it's always been the reverse. They've always wanted to try my formula. <laughs> and I let them try it, and they're like, oh. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> but um, I mean, it is, it's the truth. And, and you know, like I said, they, they, I've been, like I said, lucky enough to not have anyone who's pressured me to, oh, no, here's a hamburger, try it. No, I'm not going to. I mean, it's, you know, and, it, and growing up with the, the mentality of, you know, you're not supposed to have that, you shouldn't eat that. I mean, to this day, it's like, you know, we've never tried a steak or a hamburger or a cheeseburger or something. And it's like, we don't crave it because we don't know, we don't know what it tastes like. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're okay with it. You know, we're sticking to our vegetables and, and uh, pasta and, and all that. So, that's about it. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I'm sorry? Try it? I've never tried any meat. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even look that good. We've all tasted <laughs> 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 uh, it. Like in vegetable that. beef soup, sometimes you get those little chunks of beef, uh -huh. and I might like um, get one in my mouth and I can taste it. I'm like, oh, it just feels weird in my mouth. And I just, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and I don't even think I would like it. Like that. <laughs> But to add to this question, um, it's a good conversation starter on a date. <laughs> like if I go out to a restaurant and I'm like, oh, I want a salad, but not the cheese, and take off the eggs and all this blah, blah, blah. <laughs> They're like, what is your deal? And I'm just like. <laughs> so there's tons of questions that come, and it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he ate meat, just like everyone here probably, and we would go out on dates and, you know, I'd order vegetarian dishes and stuff like that, I'm like make sure there's no meat, and he got into that habit after a while and he turned vegetarian. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, I decided I should go vegetarian too. I'm like, why? He's like, well, to make you feel comfortable. I'm like. I feel more comfortable if you eat your meat because, yeah, I don't know. Yes, I don't really think of it as a challenge at all. You know, I feel kind of special. <laughs> Can you give any guidance to parents, uh, you know, children in PKU? If you were to deviate from the diet, say eat chicken or do something, you know, you know, we have a five month old who would just sink down the road Sure. Um, I guess basically to sum it up is how do you react to a kid cheating and how do you keep your kid from cheating? Um, you want to call it cheating? 
how do you explain? I mean, you don't want to reprimand right. him or her, right. obviously, and to keep him on track. Yeah. I know you guys didn't deviate. I don't know if you talked to other yeah. kids. Yeah. yeah. I, I actually, um, there's a woman back in Indiana who um, just gave birth to her third child. At the age of six, she was told by her nutritionist that she could go off the diet. She ate hamburgers, hot dogs, sausages, every type of steaks. But she was encouraged, though, to go off of diet. Whereas my brother and I, we were never encouraged until the age of 16, you can go off. So up until 16, we had the mentality of, why would we ever want to eat that anyways? You know, so for 16 years, we had under our belt, don't eat it. So even when I went off diet for four years, off diet to me was eating cheese. Okay, that's off diet to me. I never had meat. I, I still to this day don't <coughs> disgusting. But I think if if they're <laughs> sorry, but if if they have the encouragement, the backing of the parents and the nutritionists and the doctors, I don't think I really don't think that they would deviate from it. There's no reason to deviate from it other than curiosity or peer pressure. But even my peer pressure in high school, when I was off for four years, never pushed me into wanting to even try it. So did you find like Asked you a lot of questions when you were late at school when you're in first grade. You know, did you eat lunch? Did you have any milk? Or you just question and answer. Do the teachers help monitor that? Well, like that? Uh, I know my mom did give my first grade teacher like a book, and she knew what I could and couldn't have. But I remember in story hour, I was. It was Halloween, and my friend was eating a cookie. I'm like, oh, I want one, and I ate it, and I'm like. I think I just ate something I wasn't supposed to and I was so freaking out and I went home and I s told my mom and she's like, well, we'll just have to drink your formula, but you have to realize that you gotta be careful and watch out. You gotta make sure you know what's in everything and make, sh make sure you can have it before you eat it. And she just helped me reinforce what I could and couldn't eat and calm me down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We have been lucky enough that we've been very independent in our monitoring of the diet growing up, whereas the only time teachers were aware was like when there was a birthday and somebody brought in chocolate cupcakes, you know. The teacher would, li would seriously have something in their desk for, for us that, you know, we'd have like graham crackers or something or else. Or an apple or a fruit. So, yeah, basically. Yeah. And it's like, you know, we took care of our lunch every day. We had our thermos with our, you know, our beverage in it and we've had the the accidents where it spilled in our backpack too and we're you know, just, <laughs> just embarrassed standing in the back of the room with the teacher while you're cleaning out your lunch pail, you know, and, and uh, yeah, we've had all those experiences, but you know, we've been, we've been very lucky in monitoring the, the diet ourselves. <coughs> okay. Uh, what advice do you have for parents um, living with their PKU child? Any hints, suggestions, <coughs> any words of wisdom? Let me start. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, just realize that your kid, he'll be, he or she will be okay. I mean, she'll grow up, and he'll grow up just as good as you. I mean, do you enforce it, and then they'll grow up just the way you want them to. Um, but the one thing is, drinking your juice and keeping on your diet. It's just like brushing your teeth. You know, you, you just gotta do it to be healthy, and it's, it's not a big deal. Um, the only thing I could say is don't treat your child as if they're different. You know, just because they're on this, this diet doesn't mean that they need this extra special attention and, you know, just, and don't feel sorry for them. It's just, you know, I don't know, it's, I don't know, just don't feel sorry for them. <laughs> That's all I can say. Well, growing up with, I was number four in our family, and growing up with five children, it was always nice to see all of us being treated the same, not just John and Julia are special because they've got PKU. It was all five of us. It was never us two and then the three of them. So my advice is treat every one of your children the exact same. Just treat PKU as a diet inconvenience, and that it's a blessing that it's nothing else, honestly. I'm in agreement with others on the panel here that it's don't treat your children any different because they're not. 
and don't look at PPU as a restriction because you can go to Spain, you can go to Australia. <laughs> Heck, I wanted to be an astronaut. I'm trying to figure out how to get my records up there. <laughs> Set of lines of cheaters for now. <laughs> <laughs> Another question from the audience, perhaps? This stuck with what you guys talk about um, two times a day or three times a day with the formula. Like, specifically, how many ounces do you average a day? Because what I, I have a four year old, and I'm already looking at um, kindergarten, preschool, you know, and I know that the formula is not the best for them. I know that they're not going to be able to participate. I'm trying to already steer, you know, she has so much in the morning, so much when she comes home that, hey, she can have that sunny delight, but Capri Sun when she goes to school like everyone else. So I just want to know, like, on average, what you're doing, you know, right now she's doing really good, 30 to 36 ounces a day. So, you know, I know that that's going to go down, and I'm just wondering where. So, like, where to try to fit it in, I'm already thinking ahead and trying to schedule her. Um, she asked how, uh, we, how much formula we drink in a day and when do we space it out. Um, right now, I drink 12 ounces of formula a day. I do six in the morning and six at night. So, I don't know about you guys. I'm at um, 18 ounces a day, so I do three. I do six, six, and six. So, um, and I just measure it out in the morning. I measure it, take it to lunch. I do eight ounces three times a day. <coughs> I do eight ounces twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of transitioning responsibilities and growing up when your parents used to manage a diet and now um, you're managing the diet, how does that transition process work? Um, well, when I, like I said before, when I started to read, write, and do admin and subtracting, I started to track my diet and send it off in the blood. My mom would help me figure out where to find the food or drinks in the uh, book of exchanges, but I was, I started really early. And she, she guided me along, but I started early, so. I would say it wasn't until my, probably like 10th or 11th, yeah, somewhere around 10 or 11 that I actually started to, you know, kind of be more aware myself, not necessarily with my parents' help, but, you know, noticing what I can and cannot eat, you know, I wouldn't have to ask them at that age. It just, <coughs> of course, they'd help me every now and then, you know, okay, you can eat this or you can't eat this because, you know, it has so many fees, but, you know, I think once you get, in my case, in my sister's case, um, once we got into our early teens, that's when we've kind of taken our own control, so. As I mentioned before, Julie and I have always been involved with monitoring our diet and, and being aware of you know, everything that goes on with the diet. We, because you know, we live it every day and it, my, our, our mother or father shouldn't be um, thought of to just manage it and take care of everything. The biggest transition I remember though was when we had to start to make our own formula. <laughs> and that was fun. It basically was just a learning experience, you know, how much do you measure out, how often do you make it. And then, you know, as soon as it was transitioned over, it's, it was pretty much, okay, you're doing it now. It's your responsibility. You know, you have to drink it every day. Um, and that happened probably in our early teenage years. It was, I remember it was during the summer, and basically my mom just taught us how to make our formula, how to beverage, sorry, how to, how to make it. And, you know, at the time, <coughs> I started on Lofenilac, and Julie was on Fennel, Free, I believe it was. And then uh, since then, we, we both switched. I'm now on Paraflex, and Julie's on another version of Final Free, I think. Yeah. But um, that was the biggest transition, is when we had to, when we learned how to make our, our uh, beverage ourselves. Well, they say that you can't go back. But five years ago, when I was invited for my first summer at the Maternal PKU camp in Wisconsin, um, I found out that you can go back. I, um, when I was getting the details of the camp, they said, oh yeah, we hold it right on campus at, in Madison. Well, I went to school in Madison, and lo and behold, 
We stayed in the very dorm that I spent all four years at Madison in. So I was, you know, undergrad, and then I was involved with the dorm government, and then the last year I was even an RA. So I knew all the little secret rooms, and it was such a thrill for me. Our main meeting room was the old TV room. You know, in those days, everybody didn't have their own TV in their room. So, you know, 80 girls would go and watch the way we were. Am I dating myself or what? <laughs> And then there was the small group breakout time. We had them in the old passion pits. You know, the little dens, you guys know. So memories, memories were flooding over. Well, it wasn't until the very last night of camp, and another group was going to be using the same dorm. And it was the freshman orientation group with their parents. And, you know, they were going through our hallway to get to their hallway, and all of a sudden this guy starts lingering outside my room. And chatting a little bit, and he had seen me with the girls. And I'm going, oh man, this guy is hitting on me. <laughs> and I thought, oh. Um, and then I just, you know, quickly dropped this line, like, well, I attended this university the year before you were born. And he exited promptly. And I thought, yes, you can go back. <laughs> so um, it was it was fun for me at camp and it is just wonderful to be back here with you. So many familiar faces for me, and um, I hope it's equally exciting to be back here. <laughs> I left the clinic very abruptly at the University of Illinois 14 and a half years ago. I um, cleaned out my desk one morning, and in the afternoon, I went to pick up my new daughter at the time. And so we're a family by adoption. But that day, which I'll always remember, um, was preceded by months and months of work with caseworkers and you know, infertility specialists and all these things. Am I getting too much feedback here, Dr. Walker? No, no, it's okay. funny and louder. Oh, okay. So it was preceded by months of that, and in part of the meeting with our caseworker, we were taught the language of adoption. Um, and this was an important thing because um, whenever there's something a little bit different in your family, people are very curious about that. They're very curious and they ask questions. And then sometimes people really want to reach out and help. And then sometimes it's important to have those words that you can fall back on at any time because there are people in this world and even though they don't wake up that morning and say, I'm going to be a jerk today. They are, and they ask really stupid, hurtful questions or say hurtful things. So it's helpful to have those words. And it's helpful for you as parents of children or at PKU to have words that you can give them, that you can teach them, so that they can deal with all those curious people, those people that may want to help, and those people who are jerks that day. So let's talk a little bit about talking about PKU. We're getting back to basics, and it seems like from the day you get that phone call from the clinic, you're talking about PKU, and you're going to talk about it for the rest of your life. So let's talk about talking about and how you can help kids. There's three ways, three areas that your kids, I think, would benefit from being able to talk about PKU. And one is just responding to questions. And Jonathan mentioned being able to um, answer, a real quick answer, or um, some other people mentioned the short answer. <laughs> and if you open up your folders, and there's a packet of papers, and the first, pack, the first paper is not the paper we're going to look at first. If you can look at the one that has, uh-oh, I was plugged in there. That says, on the tip of your tongue. These are phrases that I've worked up um, in a curriculum for the University of Wisconsin that are in response to typical questions that kids are going to get. Can everybody find that? I, just, just show me that you raise your hand if you've got that packet and you're on the same page with me. Good, we're on the same page. Good. A typical question that a child with PK is going to get is, why are you eating that? With an emphasis on the that. That can happen sometimes. Or, why don't you eat meat? Here are two quick and easy short answers. I'm a vegetarian. That would be the very short answer. There's no um, opportunity here 
for a huge biochemical discussion. When you say, I'm a vegetarian, right? you got it covered. Um, but I'm, I'm following a special diet. Now, that's inviting another question, isn't it? And there are people in your life that you want to make that invitation or you want to remind them, oh yeah, you're on a special diet. I don't know if this happened to you. You can explain the diet in, in the whole regimen in great detail to someone and six months later, they completely forgot. Now, why is that? It might be your own mother. And you've gone through all of this, and she got caught in the fact that, oh my gosh, my grandchild's going to have to count every French fry all their life. And didn't hear anything about it after you said that. So there's some people you just have to remind a little. So that, that little comment, I'm following a special diet is a, a nice reminder type word. Another question is, why do you eat this way? And if you eat, if the, if the child or you say, I'm, I'm following a special diet, then the first thing people think of is weight loss diet and the flaw. You don't need a diet. Or, you know, what's all that about? And, and very simple responses, like PKU, it stands for, and this is something that you may or may not want to have your child say or instruct them to say, but I think it's very empowering for your child to be able to say that very, very big word. Phenylketonuria. It's hard. But you know what? So is, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and they, they work out that, you know? They work out the big words, and sometimes it's very cool to be able to say a big word. They don't have to say it every time they're responding to someone, but I think an important thing for your child to be able to say is what PKU stands for, because otherwise, the next question is what is PKU, and they go, blah, blah, blah. And as soon as they cannot respond, you know, other kids smell fear a mile away, right? And they'll go, well, well, you know, and then you're opening up an opportunity for teasing or other problems. So I think so a matter, as a matter of fact as you can, I appreciate what it stands for. Sometimes kids want to know, well, how long have you had it? What is this all about? Can I, you know, when did this start? How, uh, it's kind of in the, in the vein of, um, you mean you've never had a <coughs> you know, your whole life. And it's that we were surprised the group were up here. You never, ever tried it in all your life. Um, and I had it since I was born. And then those questions that come like, oh my gosh, you've never had pizza, you've never had whatever. It's no big deal. Do we see that attitude up here? We did. It's no big deal. This is how I eat. Now, these are really helpful things to be able to say. Now, if you have older kids, you may have worked out some of these things. And if it's working for your family, great. Then use those words and practice those. But if you haven't worked out some of these things, go ahead and try these kind of phrases to enable your kids to ward off what could be an opportunity for teasing. So handling questions carefully. Another area that is helpful for your kids to be able to respond to is in the area of saying no. And here on the sheet, I'd say no with style. Um, your kids are going to have to refuse food all the time. Now, I can think of some really impolite ways of refusing food. No, I'm stuck. Or, I never eat anything that had a face. You know, anything like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, they get a reaction, but I wouldn't recommend those on a regular basis. But being respectful, being matter of fact, being polite, I think is the best way for your kids just to sail through all these food adventures that they're going to be up with. So some typical, would you like more chips? No, thank you. No, thank you always works. And I was at a camp and I was working with little Ed Maine and I was working for little kids. We just practiced that. No, thank you. No, thank you. Period. I mean, they don't have to say, because I have PKU and I can't have more chips and I have to count this many chips every time. No! No, thank you. It's very, very adequate. It's polite. It's respectful. How about um, the waitress? I mean, the waitress thing is huge, right? Um, she wants to know, aren't you going to order anything else? Don't you want whatever with that? No, 
thank you. I'm satisfied. This is enough. You know, <coughs> that's enough. Um, over and over again, I, I guess I hear that one of the pitfalls that parents have is saying too much. Almost on any occasion, I, I, I'm the same way. And um, Sarah Foster, who was here moderating, recently wrote into the listserv. Um, um, Pierre, the guy in, in France, who was asking for a dolphin. And she said, one of the things that would drive me crazy was when my parents went on this whole big thing with every waitress that we went, you know, that we encountered. And a simple, no thank you, is very, very good. I just made some chocolate chip cookies, would you like some? Now, here, this is kind of the reminder, no thank you. No thank you, it's not on my diet. This is for your really well-intentioned neighbor, you know, sister, whoever, who forgets, forgets, oh yeah, oh yeah. So just add that little bit, it's not on my diet. This is for the person who knows, but ah, forgets. Um, and then there's the new friend. And those are the people who you may want to invest a little bit more discussion time on what this whole TKU story is about. If it looks like this is going to be a, 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 you know, a brand new next door neighbor and these kids the same age, it's worth investing the time to go through that whole TKU story. And that's where um, either for your, you know, if you're the ambassador for your child or for your child's sake, no thanks, I can't eat that because it's not on my diet. And then you can launch um, into your rehearsed word. Um, so these are some, some helpful words to use. Again, modify um, for what works for your family. The third area that I think is helpful to have words ready for is when asking about food. And that's, I think, the first page in your packet. And it's called, You Ask a Question. In addition to refusing foods regularly, um, a lot of times your children will have to ask questions about what's in something. And again, this can be done really in a way that makes your kid either really aggressive or you know, uh, turns people off or makes them feel defensive, or it's very polite, matter of fact, people are happy to answer. Uh, so lead in for that. Um, it's just, it's not, the lead in here, I'm gonna tell you what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, I have PKU and I can't go, blah, blah, blah. does it have this? The lead in is, I'm curious. Does this have cheese in it? Does yeah. it have milk in it? I, I'm wondering. Oh, this looks delicious. I'm wondering if it has some milk in it. Um, you know, those kind of complimentary, this is, you know, this is a rocket science, and probably a lot of you have figured this out. But having these words that your children can use can ease their way every step of the way. Um, sometimes it, it, it helps to say, I'm on a special, I'm following a special diet. That gets people's attention, and they may answer in a more specific way. Um, I'm a vegetarian, and I'm wondering. These are all meanings. And then here's the big um, word. I'm allergic to um, certain foods. I was wondering if. Now, I use allergic with caution. And I've changed my mind about it several times. So you guys are free to do the same thing. Um, Allergic, to me, if you say you're allergic but you can't PK you, you're not telling the truth. And so I had trouble with that. But then Chris Crumb, who is a dietitian in Washington State, she was here, I want to say about five years ago. She said, Linda, wake up. We have social conventions of words that we use all the time. I asked, you know, Dr. Wong, how are you? And he's going to say, I am. Fine. He's fine. <laughs> now, he could be dying of cancer here, but he's going to say to me, a stranger, I am fine. He's not dying of cancer, I hope. But, you know, he could be not fine. Is he telling a lie? No, he's following a social convention. So back to that allergic word. I think work it out in your family. If you have a kid who's in the, um, I would say, the really literal years, fourth grade, fifth grade, even up to eighth grade, where, you know, do are any of you there in those grades? And they're so literal, you just speak one little thing that are all over you. Then allergic is probably not the word, because it's wrong, it's not right. 
But if you have a high school or even a younger kid, when you talk about that you're not lying, work that out in your family. Allergic works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for some. I'm, but I wanted to address that allergic word. I'm curious now. How many of you use or in your family use the word allergic when explaining to your kid? Anybody? So about a quarter. Anybody never use the word allergic? About, about the same number. Great. You guys, <laughs> and you can struggle with it all you want. If it works for you and communicates what you need to do and allows mm -hmm. your children, child and children to do it with confidence, go, go for it. Okay, so you have your little lead in. I'm curious, and then you ask the question. Matter of fact, like, is there aspartame? Is there NutraSweet? Is there, um, you know, tofu? Whatever is in this. Is this made with milk? That might be a good thing to ask about, you know, for mashed potatoes in a restaurant. You know, is there milk in this? Um, what are the ingredients of this? So a natural, polite lead-in, asking the question, and then the follow-up. Now the follow-up is pretty key for the closure on that polite, respectful response. Well, you know, say, well then I can't ever eat any of that. I mean, that's not what you want to say. But do something like, um, oh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to eat that. Oh, I'll have this instead. Um, if, if, there, if it is a drink with aspartame, oh, I'll, I'll have a glass of water. That's always an option. Um, thanks for finding out for me. <clears throat> I'd like some of that if it's going to work. Always politeness. Oh, now, um, I think, and remind your kids, and this is at the bottom of your little sheet, people are asking for special foods all the time, all the time in restaurants. You know, put this on the side, this is a side, boil it, something. Your kids can do that too. It's fine. It's fine. And it doesn't need to be embarrassing. Um, now, it may seem kind of weird to practice these with your kids. Oh, it seems so, you know, school wise. But you know what? We practice certain words with our kids all the time. They meet another adult, and we teach them to say, glad to meet you, nice to meet you. Or, you, know, you, you teach them you know, to say, bless you after someone sees. You teach them to say thank you and, and please and all the time. And just mm -hmm. like I think Leah said it so nicely, you take care of yourself, you brush your teeth, you mix your formula, you drink it. I think these kind of words are just added to a child's repertoire, the vocabulary to pre-K you. It's just part of the yes, you know, please and thank you. <laughs> These kind of words. Um, now, what about you guys? How do you talk about pre-K you with people? Um, I, I, I think it's school booklets or is it just one gym that everybody got when they walked in? Um, <coughs> One of, did you guys get T Rex, T K U N C? No, but you got. I have copies for our workshop. I have about 30 copies. Okay, okay. Um, there, Hazel just said there are copies. This is a book that I worked up again for the University of Wisconsin, and um, this was worked up for five to seven year olds. And I do not ever, ever want to replace Why Is Mary on the Diet, but. Um, I think we, were, we feared that it wasn't going to be available forever. So um, let me just read a little bit of this for you. I did not put it on overhead. Um, so that this is very, very simple language um, for the five to seven year old, but you could go younger. It's probably also very good for some young cousins and other people in your life. The first picture is a picture of a dinosaur. And it says, this dinosaur has a long name, Tyrannosaurus rex. That's why there's a short name for it, T-Rex. And then we have our two friendly dinosaurs that keep showing up on every page. There's a brontosaurus and a T-Rex. Brontosaurus is so long, I wish I had a short name. Triceratops is long too, but I like it. And that's for kids who like saying those long, long words. And then it goes into the PK. You have a disorder with a long name. Then we'll keep from Maria. And then there is the um, phonetics pronunciation for it. Because it doesn't really roll off the tongue, does it? It's a little pretty. 
Karma teaching is the story. Now this, this um, triceratops says, what's a lot easier to say than penalty penuria? Can you say penalty penuria? So practice it. You know, it's an opportunity to practice that one word. TKU is something you were born with. Oh, isn't that a, that's just a simple phrase. Those of you with young children, that's a word that you can, you know, just a simple, I think it is something you were born with. You can't catch it from someone or give it to somebody or like a cold or a flu. But brontosaurus is, but don't sneeze on me anyways, okay? Because you're TKU, you can't use phenylalanine. And then, you know, brontosaurus says, oh no, not another longing. And he was right, that I bet there's a, a short name for it called C. C is in food. Okay, in this book, there's no mention of protein. You just talk about C. You probably talk about C in your families with your little kids. Um, and protein can be a concept that comes later. Some families like to talk about protein and how it relates to C right away. In this book, we opted not to. Having TKU means your body cannot use C from food in the usual way. Now this is a really good sentence for you to explain to anybody who does not have advanced degrees in biochemistry. PKU means that your body cannot use speed from food in the usual way. You don't have to talk about enzymes. You don't even have to say the word tyrosine after phenylalanine. You can just say it. But too much speed can hurt you. And that's true. These are all simple, truthful things. Um, the other thing is this book, I won't read through the whole thing. Um, we don't talk about enzymes, but we talk about what C does do. C is good use for growing and working. Everybody needs it for their bodies to grow and work. And then the second thing that happens in someone who doesn't have TKU, it's changed in the liver. We just say it's changed. There's no leftover C. And then my source is, I hate leftovers. And then it shows what happens in TKU. C still goes for growing and working, but C does not get changed. It builds up. And there's lot, if there's too much C that's eaten, there's too much leftover C. For these simple books, you can get green vocabulary that you want to use with people who want the short story. So even though it's you know a child's book, um, can you hold 30 copies? You know, yeah, and I, they're in our workshop, but then there's two books, so we don't have enough for all of them. Right. But if you think that that would be useful, find Hazel and, and get that. Now, if you need a little bit more advanced language for the person or the child you're talking to, there's this, a book called The Story of C, of Me and C. And it just goes through similar things. But we go a, a notch higher. And um, what I'm going to show you here is the website where you can get, you can um, download these books until December 31st. It's www.weissman.wisc.edu slash pku slash index dot you can write down. Um, the thing that this does is give just a little bit more advanced language. Again, for you to use um, with your acquaintances, with your extended family. Here, we introduce the idea of protein, and that protein is made up of a long chain of amino acids. And, and glean whatever you can from these books. Um, these you all have, that's why it's on page seven. So we start talking about protein and that it's a part of protein. And that when you eat on page eight, the protein gets um, broken down to something called amino acids. We introduce that word, amino acids. And then how the liver and the body takes those broken apart amino acids to build new protein. It's a little bit more advanced, and you may find that that's more satisfying language for you to use with um, certain acquaintances. Then um, there's two other books. So this was designed for like um, third, fourth, and fifth graders. If you have high schoolers, for well, middle schoolers, there's a, a 
one on the website called Give Me the Feedback, and then finally, um, for high schoolers, PK through Fast for Now, Fast for the Future. And it challenges a little bit more decision making based on, um, on what's, um, what's known. For example, in this last book, um, Fast Without Too Much Fee on page eight, we want to say it changes the way your brain works. So we go into some of the moodiness, some of the changes that have been documented in terms of harder to concentrate, harder to remember, harder to plan and organize your work. These are all consequences of high level. So much more specific than just that general topic. Now, everybody you run into um, and need to talk about PK, you, you don't need to go into that detail. But there may be some trusted friends that you would want to. So please, access these books if you think that they would be helpful for you for explaining PKU um, to the myriad of people that you meet in your life. All right. Um, in the back to basics, let's talk a little bit about day-to-day um, -day, uh, routines. And I think our panel gave us some great insights into what goes on day-to-day. -day. Um, I think one of the things that, that's hard and sometimes onerous for families on a day-to-day -day basis is the keeping track of fee um, techniques. And there are a lot of um, good ones that are brought out on the listserv regularly. I think uh, a visual for young children, I know Dee has worked out some for, for your daughter um, in the past. Anything that's a visual that can be removed or you know, and put back on often helps. Um, for the curriculum, we have a tree, we have a feed tree. And the leaves can fall down and spring, they can go back up or however you know you want to do it. But each leaf represents a measured amount of feed, either an exchange or um, sometimes it's helpful for eating, you know, someone has a huge tolerance, maybe 50 milligrams a leaf. For those with very small tolerances, it might be 10 milligrams a leaf. But whatever works for your family. Other families have used um, whiteboards and they um, you know, jot it down. I used it when I worked in the clinic. Um, my favorite kind of diet records to get would be the color-coded ones, where the mother would write in one color all the foods that were eaten, and then in another color um, the formula and the ounces drunk. And then, um, because I didn't have to do any work. Mm -hmm. It was just marvelous. <laughs> but sometimes those parents are so adept and keeping track and, and monitoring it. You know, they're the accounting types. We know and love. We all have people we know and love like that. Um, but they can do it in their head in no time. And so by the time the child is five or six, sometimes that really important skill is not transferred over. And so as much as you can make it hands on, I think is good. Um, I know one family that used a whiteboard or a chalkboard, especially when communicating foods that the child ate away from the family. And this is helpful. So um, my kids are in this age. I have a 12 and a 14 year old where sometimes less talking is better, especially accountability talking. And so if there's one less, what did you eat when you were with so-and-so that needs to be said in a day, that can be really good for a family, I think. So having a board where um, this boy would just come in and write down, you know, you know, an apple and, or you know, a small bag of Lay's or whatever he ate that was written down, and that mother and son did not have to have that confrontation over food. Just a, a, a hint. Mind you, you're going like this. You do something like that. Do you oh, I'm laughing about one less. We have a lot of times, yeah, we're just going. These, these are, there's some veteran parents here, um, and it, you talk about food a lot. And so if you can, in, in a trusting atmosphere, have that way to communicate, it really does help. Um, let's see, another, another um, form that worked really well for a family is, um, it was the Craig family, some of you know them. 
Um, there's access, there's some to cancer, but mom was in a great mom. And I'm sorry, Andrew, when that <laughs> But she had worked up when, when Andrew was quite young, just to check off of his favorite foods. And again, there wasn't all this onerous <coughs> writing going on. She knew that he chose, chose between five um, breakfast cereals, basically. And she very bagged this, but then he could just check out, and the, the amounts were written, and the typical amounts that he would have for breakfast. And again, instead of all the, you know, three quarters cup kit, he could just check it off, or put two, if that day he had a cup and a half. And so that made that whole record keeping so much easier. But they did it, that's something they do every day. She copied off a whole bunch of those, and it really worked for this family. Um, very organized in a family that was well worth knowing. Um, formula mixing. Formula mixing is something um, that has to be done nearly every day. We had worked out a way to do it every other day. I thought that was pretty good. Um, <coughs> formula mixing um, can be a point of resentment, I think, uh, at times. And so it's important to look at that every once in a while. So one. Um, one uh, handout I gave you was something called giving mixing a second thought. Now, those of you who are mixing formula for infants and toddlers, you can sit back. For those of you who are mixing for school-age kids, middle schoolers, who not only appreciate the fact that you're, they don't, not only don't appreciate the fact that you may be mixing their formula for them, but you may have comments about the way that you mix it. Um, you may want to give mixing a second thought. So this is the same truth. Who's mixing? Who's mixing this up? Is everyone satisfied with this arrangement? <coughs> now, if the dad is mixing it every day and he doesn't mind, great. I would say that's good. Keep it up. Um, and even if even if that child is in high school. Um, Marcy, can I can I quote you? I think about eight years ago in one of these girls, um, we were talking about mixing formula. And at the time, you must have had new white carpeting. And you made a declaration that Maggie was never going to mix formula in your house while that white carpeting existed. Now, I've seen Maggie at camp. We are good buddies. And um, you know what? She can mix her formula just fine. But at home, does she mix it at home? And do you have any carpeting? Or same old white carpeting? Same Okay, so you have to worry about it. Because Marty did not want that, you know, medical food in the you know, in her white carpeting. Anyway, my point again that I've said a number of times, you do what works for your family you know, and, and what can you know be best for everyone. So if everybody's happy, you know, with who's mixing, keep it up. When is it mixed? And is it mixed when you want it or when you need it? Now, I love that conversation that was going, I think you asked about um, the formula with food or you know, before or after. Oh my gosh, when we go to camp, it is amazing. The different ways that kids mix and drink their formula. There are the fresh drinkers. You guys may know some of these. They mix it, they drink it. And they, they want kind of lukewarm water and it's fresh. That's how, and even with a little foam on top, you know, they, they've got it down to a science. And then there are the cold drinkers. It cannot, I mean, there's nothing, they almost can't be too cold. And they have to do it the night before and can wake up and it's very cold. So this is what I'm talking about. When is it mixed and is it in the way that that, you know, the person who has to drink it really likes it. So if dad is mixing it, but he's doing it at night and the kid likes it fresh, okay, something's gotta, you know, gotta be worked out. And what is this mix and is it okay with you? Um, you know, as kids grow older, their nutritional needs really change. Um, you know, Kath was talking about she used to be on this and now she's on, well, you know, when I first started, she came to me with two formulas, and I think, you know, Jonathan and Julia can, there was, there was no options, this was it. But now there's so many different options or, or, you know, mixes that you can mix together to adjust for taste and calories and nutritional needs and, and volume. Um, I think I heard a, a collective gasp go up when someone said, oh, I think Leah said she only drinks 16 ounces a day, or is it, or it's even less, 12 ounces. <gasps> well, you know what? An infant can't 
syringe on those four ounces. We can't concentrate it to that level and have it safe um, for their body, but there are a lot of options. At, at any one time, it might be good to review, is this a good option for you? And then how is it mixed? Are there some shortcuts? I mean, every, I mean, the first question almost, when someone when they walk in new to the office after it's being diagnosed with PKU is, do you have a blender? I mean, that was just part of the first day. Do you have a blender? Well, now, well, you don't need a blender, or you can, or you can use a hand mix, right? It, there's just a lot of different ways. And it's, um, if you can shorten that whole thing up. Um, Kathy, are, are you in the shaker method? Yeah. So it makes it really, how about Julie? Do you, do you shake? You, you use a mixer. So there's a lot of ways. Just think of it's working. Evaluate it and go through it. But this is something that has to happen so often. You might as well make it as easy as possible for everyone involved. Um, and then that whole baking, ordering thing, that's a whole other, almost everyday thing, or a good routine thing. When I was at, at Girl Scout camp, we, we would sing a song before um, meals. It said, back of the bread is the flour, and back of the flour is the mill, and back of the mill is the wind and the rain and the Father's will. Well, with PKU, it's more like back of the bread is the wheat starch flour. And back of the wheat starch flour is an order to dietary <laughs> specialties. And back of the order, you know, is a big, you know, baking session to get all these things done. It's not just, you know, having bread. And so just um, are there some ways to streamline that? Um, I think sometimes what communication helps in all these things. And for that baking ordering process, um, I know in my family, I have a grocery list pad, and sometimes as a parent, as your kids get older, you may not know that the last of the wheat starch was used or the last of the mix, is it mix quick or quick mix? Somebody said it wrong to me right away and then I, mix quick. Mix quick. You know, did, did somebody mix up their, their pancakes and use the last little bit and you don't know, or even, you know, there's only two mornings left? Uh, just a means of easy communication is good for that. Um, instead of going, bread's gone, and there's nothing left. <laughs> so communication helps there. Um, at, in Maine, I just uh, spoke with a mom at their camp who did a pretty innovative thing. And this was a mom who really just three kids really seemed on top of things. And I thought, I thought she was one you know, who was doing her Saturday baking. She said, Linda, you know what? It got to be a lot for me this year. And she said, what I did is the very people who came to me 10 years ago when you know, Katie was just diagnosed and said, how can we help, how can we help, kind of forgot to ask 10 years later how we can help. And she said, I had to swallow my pride, but I asked for help. And now they, about every quarter, they have baking days. She went to her, her, her church family and they use their church kitchen. She orders a whole bunch of stuff. Some people help donate the, um, the special products. And they have quarterly baking days. There are some older ladies in the church that help out with this, some younger ones, some peers of the girl. And they bake like crazy and um, have a lot of things frozen and ready for that day-to-day -day basis. She said, it was so hard for me to admit that I needed this kind of help, but it has eased my way so much. So look around at those people who really love and care about you. And they typically want to help, and that might be, this might ease your way in this whole PKU thing. Um, I just um, had one of those odd PKU connections. My sister was having a party at her house, a, a, a World Series party, and there was a woman who was so distraught because her co-worker had to go in the hospital for four weeks diagnosed with cancer and the little girl had PKU. And as, as this woman was going to launch and went PKU, my sister was like, I know all about it because my sister here can plan my camp things all the time. She said, let my sister call you. So this woman who lives just on the south side of Milwaukee is having any number of baking days arranged 
more of a, some people who are connected to PKU directly and some are friends and coworkers. There are people really ready to help. Um, so please tap into that so that they can mix in. Um, one question that came in when, when I was asked to speak is, what happens in those day-to-day -day routines, things are going along pretty well, and um, it applies mostly to toddlers and preschoolers. Um, what happens when that child goes on strike? <laughs> Either with the, you know, the medical food or with food. There's a lot of things going on with toddlers. Toddlers um, are so different than infants, and those of you who are living through that know that. They're moving, for one thing. Um, and in terms of what's happening physically, their growth is slowing down more, you know, so much more. The first year of life, how many pounds would a kid gain? You know, 15 pounds? The second year of life, it might be more like five. So the nutritional demands that a toddler has are much less than what you just recently experienced with an infant. And then when nutritional needs are less, the appetite follows suit. So this child is not going to be as hungry as he or she was, you know, just a little while ago. So we have slow growth, we have decreased appetite, and we have this curious, demanding, contrary individual who would rather exert independence than eat. I can tell. I know this group right here. I, I know who to talk to right now. Um, you know what? There's this wonderful God-given drive in us that's called hunger. And, you know, <laughs> growth and, and eating will win out in the day. <laughs> so hang in there. Um, there some, some clinics are big formula first clinics. And um, I think that kind of relates to your question, where um, <coughs> formula is offered first and then food. Um, and you go, oh, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work in the short run. It becomes a matter of the will sometimes, and it's a battle. Hang in there. That child will eat. They do not want to die. They want to eat. So, and, and then I think at those times, the formula first um, <coughs> mantra is a good one to have, and then have the food follow. Again, we will eat or drink eventually, um, but hang in there. Um, I just want to take a, a one minute to comment on that formula first. Um, I, you know, when I first heard that, I thought, that's a really great idea. Then the formula goes in, and it's just like what our panelists were talking about. And then I'm not as hungry for the other foods, and I, but you know what? I guess I've just seen so many kids at camp who don't do that, and who are really managing beautifully. Or they eat their, drink their formula at totally different times with food. So I, Again, I hate to be so dogmatic about something like formula first, except for toddlers, and then I think we can. And then I think that would be, you know, you need, you need to be as stubborn and as contrary as they are and stick to it because it happens. And, you know, it's, it's a battle, but they'll win. Um, good routines, that's kind of all it's going to cover on day to day. Um, you may interrupt those questions as, as you wish. How much time do I have? You have 25 minutes. Okay, oh, we're good. Um, group outings are like a whole other thing that's outside of the day to day. So I want to talk about those a little bit. Some of you with teenagers have got this down. Um, so let's review. On your, in your little packet sheet, there's something called group grudge. And um, boy, I, I hear people pontificate about. It's so nice to have social events that don't include food. I don't know what country that happens in. It would be nice if that's how it was here, but boy, oh boy. I, I mean, my kid was on, my son was here. My son, Andrew, was on a soccer league. And it wasn't the traveling league. It wasn't the select league. It was the snack league. I mean, it was really. I mean, you can't, I was, I'm amazed at where food shows up. And so, guys, that's the reality of our culture, and so let's adjust and figure out what we're going to do. There are always options. 
first option is to bring your own food, and many of you have worked that out. A second option, which seems so odd for many Americans, is not to eat. Don't eat. Um, but it is an option that many of our older kids think very matter-of-factly, and they just don't. Maggie, we were in school at camp, you go to a uh, water park pool, and Maggie has like the lowest tolerance in the world. And so she knows that when somebody else gets popcorn from the snack shop, she can't do it if she hopes to eat anything for supper. She didn't eat. Now, you know, I grew up, my parents, you know, a product of the Depression. If there is food, and especially if it's free, <laughs> they know how to eat it. And so it is a different kind of mentality. They may not have to like it very much, but if it's free, <laughs> it's, it's got to be eaten. Um, so I think just to learn that it's, it's acceptable not to eat. And it's OK. Your child can have a wonderful time at an outing and not eat. They will learn that all important thing. And every social event does not need to include food. OK, what else can you do? Eat the guest food. Or the free food, yes, food should be allowed, so you should have some tea in them, and, um, and just turn down the no food. So pick and choose, um, and that's very common to do. Bringing your own food implies a lot of pre-planning. Eating the yes foods that are there and foregoing everything else, you don't really have to plan for accepting your, your daily counting. Um, you're not packing stuff up. So it's a good option, especially for teenagers who are notoriously spontaneous. Um, asking questions, and that's what we talked about before. Eating less feed the rest of the day. And I think um, we heard that from our panelists too. Oh, if I'm going to go out, I, I think Kat said that. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to eat low for breakfast and lunch. It means thinking differently than anybody else in the world, but it's become second nature and it allows for more of that, that sociability with eating. Um, and then being confident with the first responses. Anytime that these kids are in an eating situation, they're going to have to almost answer questions about food. I've seen the peer, um, we talked about peer influences a little bit, and Jones and the great story about friends wanting to try. Um, the other odd thing that happens with peers, I think, especially in high school, I've heard from high school girls, is that their friends in groups that know they're on a social side, play police. And they are on them. Have you had this path where your friends are on you? Can you eat that? Can you really eat that? Is that on your diet? And when the girls come to camp, they are so relaxed and free because nobody is asking them <laughs> if that's on their diet. It's only food that's for them. And it's such a relief not to have that almost opposite peer pressure than you would expect. Um, but it seems like those good friends are on their case and want them to stick with their diet. So food is talked about a lot. Oh, Craig, was there a comment? Yeah, okay. Um, one question that came up to me um, from the board was consequences to expect when not adhering to the diet. Um, and it, it's hard to just say that in a single sentence. In infancy, the consequences of not following the diet are devastating. And um, I admire any young family that's here to learn, you know, that, you know, that's actually what has to be, has to happen. The diet needs to be followed because of, of the devastating um, brain damage that does happen. Um, but what about when they get older? Some kids can feel that their levels are high. Some parents can tell when children's parents are high. But it's a pretty subtle thing. <coughs> and it's not like somebody starts, you know, throwing up or feeling sick or, you know, feeling really bad. And that subtlety is a really tough thing about decay rates. Um, but there are some things that are affected in the um, methylalanine, either itself or whatever it's blocking from getting to the brain that the brain really needs um, affects brain function. And they found in some specific areas that are affected. And they, they group these, um, these different actions that the brain does together 
and executive function. As I say, that executive function. So it's things like concentration, um, being able to remember, um, organizing and planning work. Um, those kind of activities that the brain does are affected by high levels. Okay, when you think about a uh, ten-year-old having to do a book report, what does this child have to do? They have to concentrate. They have to remember what they read, and then they have to—I don't know—we have to do book reports. My son has to do a book report. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, and you know, and you know, one of them is you know, dress like this, and you have to gather all these, uh, you know, you have to gather stuff and collect it and be organized. All these things that are needed just for a little book report are gonna be affected by how someone handles the mother. So you go, oh, okay, I got a C plus on the book report instead of a, you know, whatever. It's subtle, it's subtle. But I would urge you to stay on top of the diet, um, drink, have your child drink that formula, preferably in more than two doses a day, optimally three to four, um, to keep that brain functioning most optimally. Um, Dr. Cope, who is um, like the grandfather of teaching, and he's spoken here many times. And you know, I admire him so much, but when I look at his picture on the front of the um, National Teaching and Medicine, I know he's in his 80s, and I'm thinking, Will you guys invite me back when I'm in my 80s? I don't know. Anyways, he has just lived TKU, and, and what he's done is a big follow-up study to the landmark collaborative study. And Jonathan, will you recap this part of that? So they called back individuals that were part of that study as children and then um, did a number of, of studies on them, both for brain uh, fennel amylene levels and what's going on in their work. And the people that have been off diet for a while, it's not all of them, but people who have been off diet for a number of decades in some cases have pretty significant problems. And this is very worrisome to me. One is um, recurrent headaches are reported much more frequently among people off diet. Um, phobias and other mental disturbances are reported much more frequently in people off the diet. And there is a subtle but significant decrease in IQ. It averages out to be about one IQ point <coughs> per year of life off diet. Average IQ is about 100. If you're off diet for two decades, that individual could have an IQ of down to 80. And that means they no longer can do the same kind of work and thinking and activities that they did when their IQ was 100. So again, it's an impassioned plea to you know, stay the course and, and keep it up. Um, for those of you with um, real young kids, you may hear some of these veteran parents talking about the higher levels of their kid. This is not something that is typically a conscious decision. I call it TKU creep. Um, it creeps. This, this, this feed creeps into your life and you don't even know it's really happening. Um, the formula intake creeps down or it gets condensed to you know one big chug a day. This is not optimal treatment, but it happens sub subtly. And um, I guess some of these things that I talked about if you can just get a heads up or just take some time to reflect on habits or things that have crept in that allow for more tea, oh, that's not much, just a little, or you know, less formula, look at those things because it's, a, it's just a, uh, a subtle thing. No one intended for a certain child to have higher levels. So I have compassion for that because it's easy to happen, but reflect and think about where some changes could be made to optimize the life of your child. Um, are, are there any people, any parents here that represent, that have children with other metabolic conditions than PKU? And this would be your, well, I guess, it's, it's a PKU case. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, we're getting there. Um, Jim had asked me to maybe just reflect on how does PKU treatment compare to other 
conditions, I think for the sake of time, we'll skip that. Um, okay. When I was in high school, I was, I was one of those good kids. And I used that being a good kid to open a lot of doors for me. So I expected, and this was in the 70s, you know, rebellious decade. And um, so I expected by being good that I could get whatever I wanted to. Well, one time my, my parents were going to be in Chicago for the dental convention, and I had to drive to school. I needed to drive to school. I never drove to school. And every half the kids that drove to school didn't get permission to drive to school. They just did. But I went to the vice principal and asked for permission to drive. And he said, no. I was appalled. I was appalled. Well, my next class was German class. And this was a, a, a beloved teacher of mine. And you know, I'm in there crying to Mr. Palmer. I never did anything wrong. Why? Why? You know, won't he let me drive the car? I went and asked and everything. So, you know, lo and behold, by the next hour of class, Mr. <coughs> Palmer had work things out for me as I was driving to school. That was an example of when I needed an advocate. I needed someone to plead my case. I needed someone to do it with authority. And I needed someone to be that confident go-between. And this is what your children need you to be, too. They need you so often to be an advocate for them. Um, it, it's amazing. It might be a school advocacy. It might be uh, the school lunch people. It might be the insurance carrier. There are any number of times when you will need to be an advocate for them. Um, you need to plead their case. Now, how do you do that? Um, part of that is just, you know, considering the options up front. There are usually many options, well, more than two. Usually the person that you're, you know, at odds with and you each have an option, and sometimes there's really quite a few more. So try up front to figure out as many <coughs> options as you can for being an advocate for your child. And get information. Um, especially for the whole school lunch thing, that comes up on the list of so often. And every school district is under, in this country is under the same law. But how that is played out in any one school, it seems like it varies tremendously. <coughs> but there are obligations. The same thing with insurance coverage and other things. So get all the information you can about what is happening, what the someone will offer, and how to follow up on that. And then go into that party or group or individual and speaking <coughs> with authority. And I think this is an easy place to um, be aggressive rather than assertive. Being a child of the 70s, we had all this assertiveness training when I was young. And I think assertiveness is basically knowing what you need, asking for what you need, and asking for it in a respectful way. So now you're acting as the go-between. But this is the pitfall so many of us fall into. We give way too much information, or we create a spectacle, or by being aggressive, we put others on the defensive, and then we do not promote our own cause. So I think being assertive, using, you know, knowing what you need, asking for what you need, and doing it respectfully will open those doors for you. Then you're going to get a lot of practice at doing this, at being an advocate. But eventually, you want your child to become their own advocate, too. And so that means building confidence in that. Um, and so I know I gain confidence in being an advocate from the success of others. Um, and so I think it's really great that so many of you go to the camping weekend. You, you, know, you read those uh, newsletters cover to cover because you go, oh, Someone figured out how to do this, and, and, and it worked. I can, gain, you know, I can gain confidence from that. Going to the cooking classes, going, you know, reading the newsletters are a great way to build your own confidence. And then having small personal successes. You know, the first advocacy you do might not be the insurance carrier where you get it all solved. It might be just getting you know, some alternative food at a birthday party and then allowing your child to see that. And then talking it through with your child what you just did. Now, because 
we can do things mm -hmm. so often automatically, but by making it intentional and direct for them to go, oh, that's what mom did, or that's what dad did to make this happen. And then for all of advocacy, I'm going to be like Regis and say, use your lifeline. Use your, you know, if you don't know what to do in a certain case, ask the audience. And I think your perfect big audience is that listserv. And so if you're on that, go ahead and ask. And I know there's sometimes troublesome things that happen on there, but overall I think it's a great audience to get some feedback about what you can do. Phone a friend, and this friend you know, can have some detail or not, but bounce off those ideas. And then eliminate <coughs> some of your options. Like this is check out your options, but eliminate, especially if you're trying to build confidence in your own child for making a decision. My Andrew uh, has a lot of trouble making decisions. And so sometimes eliminating options help. Like, so we just had Halloween last night. And so I said, what do you want to be for Halloween? He had no idea. All right, so then we eliminate options. Do you want to be scary or do you want to be, you know, funny? Scary. Okay, we just knocked out all, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. All right, scary. Do you want to be, you know, frightening or bloody or, you know, whatever? <laughs> and so you can, you can eliminate these options along the way and help your child learn in the decision making. Now, what I gave you a Halloween example. It might be that whole carrying formula. That's a very hard thing to think through and, and make decisions about. I can take formula to school. Uh, I don't know. <coughs> okay, are you going to drink formula at lunch? No. You do, you know, okay, then, then we'll work it out with the nurse. But eliminating some of those options may help you get a clear path on what's going to be acceptable for you or your child. Um, and I think just, again, being very intentional about passing those things on. <coughs> um, comments about peers. I think, I think our panel gave us some good insights about what happens with peers. Um, the whole peer influence changes as your child grows. I think what happens in grade school, almost just early grade school, is, is that awareness that, oh, I'm eating a little different than everybody else. But it's kind of a matter of fact thing. It's not until those middle school years, which I think can be the clearest, um, where the true teasing for anybody who's different in any way, and it can be braces, it can be glasses, it can be a weird haircut, it can be drinking formula, it can be having a, a bread that looks kind of white. Um, so there, that's, and, and I think the outright pressure then to belong and to um, you know, put the guys aside, aside can be the strongest. And that's where um, your kid may not be looking to you either at that same time. Middle school years are tough. Um, I think how you can help point out the real friends and really enable those friends to be an advocate and help for your child. And then, um, building confidence by planning, doing as much planning as you can. High school seems not to be the big problem that you might expect. There's peer influences, but they don't seem to be surrounding the diet. Parents of high schoolers, will you nod or go like this to me? Yeah. High school is easier than middle school? <coughs> yeah, yeah. High school there, people are much more accepting of other kids, and it's you know kind of like, well, well what are you drinking? Let me, let me try it. Um, but spontaneity is the name of the game in high school. And so planning for spontaneity, if you can do such a thing, I think it'd be very helpful. Thinking through, okay, where are you going to be, you know, what can you get out of a vending machine? What can you get out of a quick mart? What can you, you know, when you need to eat? Um, and this happens on the way home from those track meets that went, you know, three hours longer than you anticipated, and everybody's climbing out of the bus and wanting to eat. So it's planning for that unplanned is what I would recommend for um, parents of high schoolers. Um, and then, um, and then how, I think the other thing to really plan is how to work <coughs> in the medical school in those really, really long days. The high school kids are busy and active from noon until way past, I mean, from morning until way past dusk. So 
So this math chart is going to be able how can we work these things in? Um, it's something to, to be planned. Okay, Jim, where are we at now? Two minutes. All right. In conclusion, we'll do that. Um, there are a million things that I could tell you to do to be perfect parents. And um, we can't all do it. It's hard. It's a hard, hard job. Um, but I think there are lots of systems here to help you do the best you can for you and for your child. Stay involved with your kids. And I, I, and I, read, I read a ton of stuff. Now I'm reading your last best shot. And this is a parenting book, you know. I'm, I'm grasping at my last strings here. Um, keep loving them. Keep other people in their lives who love them too, so that when you aren't the most effective and helpful person in their life, there is someone who can be. And just remember, you are not alone in this parenting game. And I think just looking around this room, you can sense that. And you know, the listserv, the newsletter, and groups like this can ease your way in parenting with that added challenge of PKU.